Okay, I'm just going to make myself the host so that I could um, share my screen in one second. Okay. Okay, so we're going to start uh, tonight's class. Tonight's topic is all about protests um, and protest movements and what is the halachic and spiritual and Jewish and biblical approach to all of those questions. This is the third class in our series. I'm sorry we didn't meet last night. I understand some of you might have gotten on. I'm sorry that the, if the information wasn't clear. Um, but the first two classes, before we took a one week break, uh, the first one was all about um, reparations I believe that was the first one we talked about. And we basically went through Torah sources around what's called mitzvah ha'anaka, the mitzvah of, it basically means reparations. It means these gifts that we were obligated to give slaves when they were set free. Um, of course, there was a modern equivalent of this in 1863 and 1865, when actually the original plan was that uh, every slave would, every former slave would receive 40 acres and a mule. And actually, it's an interesting counterfactual to imagine, to try to think about, you know, how would our society be different? How would racial inequities uh, be different uh, had there been generations of wealth uh, within the African-American community that would have even come just from those 40 acres, acres and a mule? Um, but we saw different sources about it. And it is interesting to note, and I, I pointed this out before, that even people who are against reparations because they think that they're not practical or they think that you know it doesn't make sense for 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 right now uh, descendants of slaves many of them are, can be upper middle class you know why would you give um, or even wealthy why would you give them reparations when there are many people who are poor who would need it in different ways and those are all interesting questions that we talked about but a lot of people that I've read, even people who are very opposed to reparations say it's one of the greatest tragedies of American history that the slaves did not receive ha'anaka. They didn't receive this biblical concept of reparations. And we saw that it wasn't only in the halachic literature, but it was also built into the story of Yitzias Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, that Hashem insisted that the Egyptians uh, give the Jewish people. And we're going to actually come across an interesting text about that, that I would think is actually related to um, uh, protests and perhaps even looting. Um, I think we're going to find a text that actually says something very interesting about that. Um, but one of the ways that the Jewish people received reparations, if you will, was the Egyptians gave them tons of gold and silver. And the text says, et Mitzrayim. they cleared out Egypt. Furthermore, after they were chased out, after they fled, I'm sorry, the Egyptians chased after them. And at the Sea of Reeds at Yam Suf, all of their gold and silver came up. And the Midrash talks about the fact that Hashem did it, Vishana, and then repeated it. Hashem gave them reparations twice, if you will. And not only that, it was built into the whole idea, the Brisbane Absarm and the covenant of the parts, when Hashem told Avram, your children will go down to Egypt, but don't worry, they're going to come out after 400 years. And afterwards, they're going to go out with great wealth. So that was the first thing we talked about. Then last week, I, to me, or two weeks ago, to me, that was a very interesting class, you know, conceptually, intellectually, trying to think, what is the ideal halachic society? Or how, how does halacha I, uh, view, view the ideal society? Is it one which is colorblind or race neutral or race conscious? One that takes, con uh, takes let's say, different races or different minorities or different vulnerable groups of people and actually very much structure society around that. So one view would be race neutral. Uh, the other one would be race conscious, very much aware of, of race and perhaps other kinds of uh, minorities or vulnerable populations and trying to figure that out. Obviously, affirmative action would be a very prime example of the latter. Um, and we talked about different halachic sources, about different concepts that we have in halacha, different categories of people, the ger, the yatom, the almana, the foreigner, the the orphan, the widow, and we actually had very interesting sources about widows as a category treated as with special rules, even if the widow is the wife of the king, right? And the king dies and she's left with tremendous wealth, 
but there's something about being in certain categories that perhaps we have a certain obligation. It was interesting, right? It's, it wasn't clear cut and definitely within Judaism, and this is something that I believe very strongly in, right? While as Jews, we have to be um, very sensitive to Jews of color, um, but the ideal should be that your primary identity, at least within Judaism, is that you're a Jewish person, right? And, and there should be no difference. Like, like when, I, when I know, and I think this is actually a big change, and I think a ch change for the better. Like when I grew up, the idea of, let's say, a Jew of color, let's say it was a convert or an Ethiopian Jew, the idea that that person would have an easy time finding a shidduch, finding a marriage within just standard Haredi Ashkenazi society, probably very small chance, even though they're 100% halachically Jewish. And now that's not the way it is. Now in Israel, um, especially in the Dati Lumi, in the religious Zionist community, where you have Ethiopian Jews are really integrated uh, into the yeshiva system and the the note she roots is the system for the for the young women and men and they're 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 very much in social circles together it's very integrated and uh at least from what i what i can see and you know there are studies about this in order to in order to um kind of gauge racial attitudes you know um would what percentage of americans let's say would be of white americans would be okay with their children marrying someone of a different race right and those things I, that those things would turn towards the idea, and at least I think that it, within Judaism, I think that's actually certainly as long as someone's Jewish, I think that that is obviously something a positive development. That at least I see in Israel, and hope that that will be that will spread. But anyways, but there's lots of questions around those issues as well: race neutral or co colorblind versus being very aware of race as a category, and trying to um, help out vulnerable populations. Now. The argument can be made that yes, ideally in some future time, we are trying to get to a colorblind society, a race neutral society, but perhaps in the interim, in the immediate present, we have to do certain things in order to get where that's possible because the, the gaps are just so overwhelming that you can't just say right now, we're gonna have a colorblind society that will just perpetuate and hold up all the different gaps. These are very, very important arguments. And we talked a little bit about them last time. This time, we're gonna talk about the issue of protest. Um, and let me share my screen. Give me my source sheet here. Okay, so give me one second. Every time I <laughs> share my screen, I just like to get it all set up where I can see the chat box. So people are welcome to uh, ask questions. I have my chat box open and I also have, uh, can see at least some of you, which is nice. And I got my chat box open. So feel free if you have any questions through the source of, through the class to ask any questions or in the chat box or also to unmute yourself and ask questions that way as well. Okay, so um, this was actually the, uh, the picture of protest that I put on my um, Facebook page when I announced the class on my Facebook page. And I have three different protests here. And the reason why I did is because I think in the current milieu in America, when we're thinking about protests, we're thinking about Black Lives Matter protests. And that's certainly a very big one that's taken up a lot of our um, energy and our, a lot of our thoughts. And we're very aware of it right now. But the truth of the matter is there are other kinds of protests too. I just have some other pictures. I thought this was, <laughs> you know, people protesting. This was from England, just a picture I got. No more lockdowns. If we lose the pubs, we lose the soul of England, right? So people, <laughs> people have very, very strong opinions and they're protesting on the left. This is probably on the right, what you would call. And what's so interesting is the Haredi protests. The issue of protests for Jews, when we think about it and its permissibility or maybe its requirement, it's not only something that we should think about in terms of Black Lives Matter or other kinds of protests in America. In Israel, there are protests all the time. And some of the people who are doing most of the protesting or the, or the ones that get in the news a lot are Haredim. Why are Haredim protesting in Israel? There are a bunch of reasons. I myself participated in a lot of those. I used to look like these people here, right? I used to look like that. I used to have that. And I used to have the hat. I used to go to some of these protests. I don't know how much I believed it. I thought it was interesting. You know, I would go. I, I, so my first protest, probably the first three protests that I ever went to in my life were these kinds of protests. And we were protesting the fact that 
uh, Israel was threatening to to um, to uh, enlist Haredim into the army, or sometimes there would be issues with cemetery, with cemetery desecrations. We would protest that, or there were protests about about um, about Shabbos, right? Let's say a certain street would open up through the Haredi community, or even if went near the Haredi community, the Haredim would be there protesting. And, you know, we're gonna talk about protesting uh, with violence, without violence, you know, nonviolent protest. A lot of those protests are violent. I never participated in that. But a lot of those protests are violent. The uh, violence of choice is throwing stones, okay? Uh, to the extent, this is just a funny aside, <laughs> I remember hearing a story, and actually I think I heard it, I remember hearing it when I was younger, and then I heard it again on a podcast called Headlines about maybe about uh, three months ago. And the story is that, um, and this is kind of one of those insider jokes, but the story is that, the story or the joke is that um, somebody walks into a Sfarim store, a bookstore in Meisharim, and he sees a pile of stones there. So he says, what are these, what's this pile of stones here? Why are you selling stones? So they said, because when we, when, when we go protest, so on Shabbos, you can't just pick up a stone and throw it because the stone is muksa. You can't, they would pick up the stones and they would throw it at the cars, but the stone is muksa. So it's muksa on Shabbos, so you can't just pick it up. But if it's muchan, this is one of the halachas of muksa, if it's, if, it's, um, if it's set aside before Shabbos, then it's no longer muksa. So here, these are stones that are set aside for Shabbos. So these are okay for the, for the it's a joke. I don't know if it's real, <laughs> but so then, okay, now this is a really insider part of the joke. Then they saw really big stones, right? That were much bigger than the small ones. So they said, well, what are the big stones for? So I'll say the joke and then I'll probably have to explain it. They said, oh, that's for the people who follow the Chazonish. The Chazonish was, was famous all of his shiurim, all of his measurements were very big. Like when it comes to Kiddush, how much Kiddush you have? A huge Kiddush cup. How much matzah do you have to have on Pesach? A huge amount of matzah. So the measurement for the people who followed the Chazanish was a bigger stone, right? Some had a small, <laughs> okay, it's a joke, right? But the point is, it's, it's a joke to the extent that there are chuvot. There's responsa literature written about when you're throwing your stones on Shabbos at the police or at the cars that are going by, how do you get around the problem of muktzah, of the stones? So it's not such a joke because there, there are actually sources in the responsa about that. So like the idea that like, you know, no protests, you know, Jews would never be engaged in a protest that had violence. It's not true at all. You know, there are people, you know, throwing stones, obviously, you know, you look at footage of the, of the um, protesters um, during the disengagement from Gaza in 2005, I think it was in 2005, if I'm remembering correctly. You look at the video footage, you'll see religious Zionist yeshiva students throwing stones at the Israeli, at the IDF, at the Israeli police, because they were gonna pull them out of the Gaza Strip. You know, they were gonna pull them out. And there was definitely violent protests. Not, now, of course, there, you know, there were, most of the people were not violent, but that definitely happens. Anyways, oh, I see Ruth had a comment. There was a protest years ago by Orthodox women who were upset with the high price of kosher meat. Exactly. That's a great example of protest on the Lower East Side. Um, the, the, they, 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 it was more of a, I think it, maybe it was maybe more of a boycott, you'd call it, I guess. They, would, they boycotted the meat industry because the prices were too high and they were able to be effective. By the way, some of the most impactful protests in history have really been boycotts, right? You know, we today, especially in the Orthodox community, in the pro-Israel, you know, center-right community. We, we think about boycott, we're like, oi, boycott, BDS, you know, that, which is something that we probably don't agree with, and that's fine, of course. But boycott has very, very strong, important history. In fact, I'm reading this book, I'm gonna quote it a few times. It's a great book, this is called, And the Walls Came Tumbling Down by Ralph David Abernathy. He was like the, the Chabrusa of Martin Luther King, right? He was the, Martin Luther King's, they lived together in Montgomery, then they moved up together to Georgia, together to Atlanta. And he was really, uh, for the Southern, um, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Council, the, the group that really uh, was the leadership of, the, of a lot of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, Abernathy and Martin Luther King were together. They were right there together. And 
obviously Martin Luther King never got a chance to write his autobiography of what happened during civil rights, but I think this is probably one of the closest things that we have. Obviously there's a lot of scholarship, but this is a really firsthand account. So I'm reading this book, it is just a fascinating book. It's gonna come up a number of times, but one of the big topics in the book and where they really got started was with the Montgomery uh, bus boycott for after, um, you know, after Rosa Parks refused to sit on, to, to, to stand and she got arrested. And then they did the whole boycott of that whole bus system in Montgomery. And that boycott was really made, made such a huge change and that integrated the bus system in Montgomery and then many other cities followed that model. So a lot of protests is boycott. And the, of course, that's a great example that Ruth is bringing, bringing for us. Okay, now let's start with our sources. What I'm gonna do is and I'll tell you exactly how I prepared this year. I, I found some articles, I looked online, I found some articles about protest and Judaism and I, none of them, they, they felt to me like they were just like kind of pulling at different sources and saying, you know, here's a source that kind of relates to protest. They weren't really speaking to me and we'll, maybe we'll get to some of those sources, but I thought, you know what I wanna do? I wanna actually look through the Chumash is specifically looking at the story of the Exodus. And we've looked at parts of this, especially with the class on reparations, because there, that was a big part of the reparations parsha story. But looking at specifically as the Jewish people now want to leave, does the Torah say anything about the use of protest in order to get out of this injustice of slavery? Now, I don't want to compare the injustice of slavery to what happened in the 1960s or what's happening now with Black Lives Matter. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make any comparisons. I'm just saying as a general principle, the concept of protest, how do we see it treated or understood in the Torah? And some of the questions that we need to think about is, are we able or maybe even obligated to protest when something, when we believe something wrong is going on? Now, obviously people will disagree whether something wrong is going on, but are we able to, or are we obligated? Are we even allowed to, perhaps uh, violate law, okay? Civil disobedience. Is civil disobedience a category which is recognized in Judaism and Halacha or in the Torah? What about beyond civil disobedience? Destruction of property. Is that ever okay? And obviously the most controversial question is violence. Is violence ever okay? Obviously Martin Luther King and Reverend Abernathy, they preach nonviolence. But is violence ever okay? You know, there was a fascinating, uh, in the beginning of the, a uh, few weeks after George Floyd, there was a fascinating article. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the academic. I think his name is Daniel Gillian. Daniel Gillian, a very interesting article. I think the article was in GQ. I don't know why, but he was interviewed in GQ. And, but he's, a, he's an academic, I, f I think I forgot, at, at one of the Ivy League schools, you know, very respected academic. And uh, his area of research is protests. And basically, right after George Floyd, um, this was before John Lewis passed away. Now he's obviously since since been deceased, he's deceased now. But in the first few weeks, when he was alive and still able to issue statements, he was like said, "I'm so proud of the protesters. I'm so proud of BLM. I'm so, I'm so proud of the fact that there's you know especially racial diversity." But he said you have to make sure that it remains nonviolent. You have to keep to the <laughs> principles of Dr. King of the 1960s. And um, one, of the, um, one of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement, she wasn't disagreeing with the concept of, 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 uh, of nonviolence, but she just said she thought that it was wrong that he was focusing on nonviolence at that moment when look, someone, you know, George Floyd just died and that might not necessarily be the, be the right way. So that's what, that's what happened. There was like a little back and forth. And then this academic named uh, Daniel Gillian, uh, you can look him up, Daniel Gillian, G-I-L-L-I-O-N. Uh, he has a whole, he has books about this topic. He basically wrote this, he wrote this response and he, where he basically said, it was very, very interesting. He basically said, you know, um, I personally, this is what this, fellow was saying, I personally believe in nonviolence, but the notion that violent protests don't work is not true. He said, if you look historically, actually, and he gives many, many examples about how violent protests have worked. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting thing that I have really been thinking a lot about, which is, 
and, and, and this is really coming out in my reading of this book, and I'm sorry that I'm talking too much and not enough in the sources. I want to jump in the sources in a second. But when you think about nonviolent protest in the 50s and the 60s, and I, I've been reading a lot about it now, the nonviolence was not just an ethical imperative. It was that. It was an ethical imperative. They believed that it was a system of ethics that you had to be nonviolent, but it was also a strategy. What does it mean that it was a strategy? What it meant was they believed that since there were the white police officers in the South were so racist, they believed that what would end up happening is that even if they just sat at a lunch counter or even if they just were in a street and they were you know, not, not dispersing when the cops told them they would, that the cops would be violent and bludgeon them with, uh, with, with, with billy clubs and, and, and send dogs after them. And they were right. And what Martin Luther King and the other nonviolent people said, if we could make our bodies limp and they do that to us and that stuff gets on camera, and there were many famous pictures of this, you know, think about Bloody Sunday with, with John Lewis also, right? And those pictures go all around the country. It's going to be a national embarrassment and change will happen. So nonviolence was not just, it wasn't just an ethical system. It was actually a strategy. And the interesting thing is that I think that that strategy might not work as well today because I don't think, first of all, obviously many, many cops now are, are, the police force itself is much more integrated, right? And racial attitudes are much less. A lot of what the protests are about are about what's called systemic racism, not racism, not, not as much racist beliefs. So the idea of having people send dogs after people, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen at all, but it's not gonna happen as much. So therefore, as a strategy, it's probably not as effective, but nonviolence back then was. So the question is, is protest okay in halacha? Is it okay to have civil disobedience? Can you break laws in that context? How about destruction of property? And how about violence? Is violence ever okay? Those are the questions I wanna think about. So let's start with the first source. What I'm gonna do is I, I think I'm actually gonna make this a little bit bigger just so it's easier for you guys to read. Maybe, maybe a little small, okay. All right, here we go. So here's the first text, Vaya Avidu, this is um, in the beginning of Shmos, all right, the Jewish people go down to Egypt, and the text tells us, Vayavidu Mitzrayim es b'nei Yisrael b'farach. The Egyptians forced the Jewish people to serve with back-breaking uh, labor. They really, really pushed them. They really tried to make them work as hard as they could. By Yimaru es Chayim, they embittered their lives by Avodah Kasha with hard work. The Chovervein with all the different things, all the work in the field that they had to do. And here is a very, very important text. The first text I would say about protest or maybe about civil disobedience. The king of Egypt said to, and there's a, actually a discussion in the commentaries how to interpret this. Does this mean said to the Jewish midwives or does it mean the midwives who were appointed over the Jews, right? Some people say that these women were not even Jewish. I mean, the text tells us, Shema Chat Shifra Shema Sheni Pua. One of them's name is Shifra and one of them's name is Pua. And I'm sure we're familiar with the Rashi who claims that Shifra and Pua refers to Yocheved and Miriam, okay? But that's not actually in the text itself. Not, not in the text itself. By Yomer, and what does the king say to these midwives? When you, when you uh, deliver the Hebrew woman, look at the birth stool. If it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. This is one of the solutions to the Jewish problem. What's the solution? Kill all the boys. If you only have girls, they're not going to be able to perpetuate themselves. This is clearly 100% unethical, right? This is a terrible thing. This is completely immoral. What happens? The midwives feared Hashem. They did not do what the king of Egypt had said. They let them live. The king calls the, the midwives and he says to them, why did you do this thing? Why did you go against my command? Now, I want to point out, going against the king's command means going against the law. What were these women doing? They were breaking the law, okay? They were breaking the law. Now, you say, yeah, but the law was so immoral, right? 
that's where you get to the problem of we just take it as they okay fine we're okay with protests but they better not break the law right well what if the law is immoral that's where it starts to get complicated right and what if the law it's not necessarily immoral like go kill the kids but let's say the law is you're not allowed to uh protest you can't gather right you know MLK broke the law all the time because the protest, they basically every single time the, uh, this was again, it's in Jim Crow segregation in the South. So every time they wanted to make a protest, what happened? The law was that this was an unlawful gathering. They said, oh, you're disturbing the peace, right? That's why they got kept getting arrested all the time. So you know what they actually did is interesting. We'll see a little later on a text about this. Sometimes the way they would get around it is they would say, this is a prayer rally. <laughs> we're just, we're just davening, we're just praying, you know, this is just a prayer. And then they would give their speeches and the speeches would be the regular kinds of the speeches that you'd give at a protest. I mean, that was, I think, one of the advantages that the protest movement was a religious movement. Today, it's not like that. It's kind of an interesting thing, you know, in studying, a lot of people are writing interesting differences between the 1960s and now. But anyways, it was, it was, it was illegal. Ja I'm gonna get to your comments in a second, James, but let me just finish the text, but thank you for putting them there. So they said, look, we, the reason why it happened is because the Jewish women are not like the Egyptian women. They're so, they're, they give birth before we even get there, basically. So we have no chance. Hashem dealt well with the midwives. The people multiplied, they increased greatly. Because the midwives feared Hashem, that he made houses for them. So question. What does it mean he made houses for them? So here, our, this translation has he with a capital H, means God made them houses. And that follows Rashi's interpretation that what does it mean by Yaslehem Batim, that he made houses for them? This means houses, means dynasties. These women, Shifra and Pua, who are the mothers of Aharon and Moshe dynasties of the priesthood and the Levites and the royalty, which are termed houses. So in other words, what's the idea here? Who made them houses? It was a reward for Moshe, for, for Miriam and Yocheved and their descendants because of their amazing act of courage. But if you look in Rashbam, Rashbam has a different interpretation of what does it mean he made them houses. He made them houses, lishomram. This was a form of house arrest to guard them, to make sure they couldn't go out to prevent them from going up further and doing it again. In other words, who is the person who made them houses? Not God, but Pharaoh. Pharaoh put them in jail. Meaning, this is like the first example, right? At least in the Torah, where somebody protests against what they were commanded to do. There's civil disobedience. They break the law. Now, the law was an unjust law. The law was that you have to kill a very unjust law. You have to kill every Jewish boy. They did civil disobedience. They broke an, a law which they understood to be not just. And what was the result? They were thrown in jail. Here's the history of protests, right? Here's the beginning of it. Very, very interesting. Okay, James has a few comments. MLK was not always the proponent of nonviolence that we think of him uh, as now. All right, interesting. I'd love to see some, uh, some text. I mean, I've... I've heard him say things like explaining that violence is the rage of the oppressed. I've heard certain, certain quotes along those lines, but at least in my reading, he's always going back to the thing of, and I've, I've like literally in the last three weeks, listened to every speech that I could get a hold of a few times, but I would love to see, I would love to see um, some sources about that. I mean, like if you, like I, if you read the um, letter from the Birmingham jail, um, you know, his, the whole point of the letter is, you know, he believed that he and their movement was in the center and you had more conservative um, blacks and whites, of course, even if they were progressive and trying to uh, uh, get rid of segregation and Jim Crow, but they wanted to do it more behind the scenes through negotiations. And then on the other side, you had SNCC and, star and, and, and people who were, who were uh, black nationalism, they were really were more closer towards uh, advocating violence. But he was he always kind of felt himself in the center, but it's definitely right. Okay, let's see. You also said it was illegal for more than a few people of color to gather together in public in many places in the South. He often said that while violence was not his style, he completely stood by it as the rage of the oppressed. But the question is, what does that mean? Does that mean that he said, I understand 
that violence is the rage of the oppressed, which is a very, very powerful statement that we shouldn't just dismiss it. And I'm going to have sources here where we're going to have violence. Or does it mean that he actually uh, condoned it? That's the question. Did he condone it? Do you think that it was ethically justifiable? Or did he just say, I understand where it's coming from? I think those two things are different. And that's a good question. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a scholar of Martin Luther King, obviously. OK. Anyways, let's go on with the next source. Next, But the first set of sources just established this idea that just because something is the law, the law doesn't necessarily mean that, it's, that it has to be followed. There's just law and there's a, a, a not just law. Actually, at this point, I do want to um, play for you a little piece from the letter, for, letter from Birmingham jail, OK? Which actually, the, the background to this letter um, I was reading a lot about, um, this was in 1963, after they had integrated the Montgomery, Alabama buses. Then a few years later, in 1963, they were asked to come in. Of course, some people said they were outside agitators because they weren't living in Birmingham, but they came in and they tried to do similar things. And um, basically, um, at a certain point, literally, MLK just went out to protest. And again, it was illegal, it was unlawful for them to protest and he was sent to jail. And um, it's very interesting, in this book, um, uh, a, a lot, in a lot of the previous times, Abernathy kept getting arrested together with Martin Luther King. So they spent a lot of time together in jail. And a lot of times they were in the same cell. And um, this was with, um, what's his name? A Bull O'Connor or something, one of, the, one of the terrible segregationists in the South, uh, the, the, the head of police in Birmingham. He, he thought that he was smarter. So what he did was he separated the two. He didn't let them be in the same cell. And um, Abernathy says, like, he's a very spiritual person. That's why I'm really enjoying reading this book. He's like, it was God that put that together that we were in different rooms. Because had we been in the same cell, we would have been talking all night and strategizing and joking around because they were really good friends. He said, but because Bull Connor, O'Connor, or Connor, whatever, put us in different uh, cells, Martin didn't have anything to do. So he wrote the letter from the Birmingham jail. <laughs> so it was a good thing that we were in separate rooms. I thought that that was very good. Um, by the way, even before I get to that, this is a little piece from the book. I thought this was so interesting. Um, from this from the book and the, and the walls came tumbling down. So um, a after they were in separate cells, but one time they were walking together outside when they were getting some exercise and the, the guards kept saying, don't talk, you can't talk. But they were trying to whisper to each other. They wanted to talk to each other. So uh, this is Abernathy talking. We walked around the edge of the fence like animals, exploring the farthest reaches of our cage. Martin said, I'm writing a reply to the letter from those clergymen in the newspaper, meaning the thing that, that, that precipitated the writing of letter from Birmingham jail, which that letter, by the way, and, and it's a, you can actually, he gave, he gave it over in oral form afterwards. We're going to hear some of it. It's like an hour long. It's a, it's a huge discourse on nonviolence, on, on the theory of nonviolence. It's really, really powerful. And basically, the thing that precipitated it was there were a bunch of clergy people, progressive Christians, and one rabbi too. There was a reform rabbi there, the rabbi of Temple Emmanuel of, I forgot which southern city. Maybe, I think it was Birmingham, actually. Um, and these these clergy people who were progressive and liberal and were against, against segregation, they were saying, this is not the way, the way that, this, that the Southern Christian leadership are doing it, the way that Martin Luther King is doing it in his movement. It's not, it's not the right way because it's extreme. You should be negotiating. You shouldn't be breaking the law. You have to keep the law. You can protest, but you can't, can't break the law. These were some of the things that they said in their letter. They published a letter in the newspaper and the letter from the Birmingham jail was a response to that. So anyways, so now he's trying to write a response in jail. So um, Reverend Abernathy asked Martin Luther King, did they give you anything to write on? Like, how are you writing this letter? No, he said, I'm using toilet paper. And there's a whole story. He wrote it on toilet paper and then he snuck it out. His lawyer came in and he snuck it out a few sheets of toilet paper at a time. And that's how it got out. Very, very interesting. Anyways, I'm like, what? He wrote it on toilet paper. So I did a little experiment. I tried to write on, on my like soft ultra, ultra fluffy uh, toilet paper, <laughs> ultra soft Charmin toilet paper. You can't write on it, right? So for the fact that he was able to write an hour long discourse on, on toilet paper, you could tell what kind of toilet paper that they were given in the, uh, in the Birmingham jail. But anyways, I wanna just, I wanna play for you a little piece about this very, very significant point. And then we're gonna take it back into the Torah from this is from Martin Luther King on the idea of, of, uh, of breaking laws. 
Are you allowed to do civil disobedience? Are you allowed to break laws as part of a protest? So I, I was not able to get it exactly at the moment I wanted to listen to. The first 20 seconds aren't quite as relevant, but here we go. This is, let me, oh, you know what? I think I have to stop share and share it again in order to include the sound. Give me a second. Hold on one second. Let's see. Yeah, share computer sound. When, after I start doing it, give me a thumbs up if you can actually hear. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954, outlawing segregation in the public schools, at first glance it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether the law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law of the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statues are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Okay. So uh, obviously that was that's very important. Basically what MLK is saying that there are just laws and there are unjust laws. And when we deal with civil disobedience, I mean, he was the thing that he was accused of is how can you be saying that we should be going out and breaking the law? Now breaking the law meant unlawful gathering of people. As James said, more than a few people who were black were gathering that was considered illegal in, in Jim Crow South. So, how can you tell us that we should break that law when you're telling the southern states that they have to follow the Supreme Court's law of integration, of getting rid of segregation? You know, it's, it's contradictory. And he says, because there, there are just laws and the law of the Supreme Court that decided, you know, that uh, segregation was, was, was illegal, that was a just law. And the law that said that people couldn't gather in order to protest, that's an unjust law. Any law that supports segregation would be considered an unjust law. Now, this is actually very interesting because as you apply it to today, I think it gets a little bit more complicated. It definitely gets a little more complicated because, you know, there, you know, I'm sure that there, there aren't, it, this is obviously all subject now to interpretation, but there's no more segregation on the books anymore, obviously. You know, uh, the Voting Rights Law has been Act has been passed, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, all the different things, all the legislation, now we're dealing more with just a, a legacy, a history of racial inequalities. Sure, there's racism in people's hearts, you know, whatever it is, it's still there. And every once in a while, you'll have a terrible inc incidents with a police brutality and whatever, and unfortunately, way too often. But the point is, it's not necessarily that you're dealing with laws that are inherently racist. The law itself, maybe because of a whole history of racism and oppression and and economic disparities, 
that the, there are problems, but it's really hard to think about it that way. But the point is the concept, the very concept of breaking a law, we should not say that that's inherently against ethics and it's not inherently against the Torah, as we clearly see from these miyaldos evriyos, these Jewish uh, midwives. They say, well, that was extreme situation. That was a law. The law of the land was that you're supposed to kill every Jewish boy. That was the law. It was obviously Nazi law is immoral. Pharaoh law is immoral. You know, I'm not comparing any of the situations, but obviously Jim Crow South, that's immoral. So therefore you are not bound to follow that law, you know, and you can then apply it. Now, then what ends up happening is it's just a disagreement about whether the law is immoral or not. In other words, a lot of times when, let's say, conservatives and, and progressives are disagreeing about this, and the conservatives are saying, you shouldn't break the law, that's not really their argument, because they would admit that if they believe that the law was, it was unjust, that you should obviously fight against it, right? And also when liberal, you know, liberals will turn around and they'll say, you know, how could, uh, <laughs> How could the uh, how could some of the conservatives who were let's say were opposed to um, some of the COVID restrictions? You know, they're marching in the street. I had a picture of that. You know, they're breaking the law. What do you mean they're breaking the law? In, from their perspective, it's an unjust law. If we're if we're willing to be open to that, we have to be open to it on both sides, right? It's against the law for them to walk around with a gun. Yeah, but if they feel that it's immoral for society to to, to restrict people's gun use. <laughs> then you can't say they're breaking the law. You can say, I don't want them to do it because I think that they're wrong about the basic principle and the basic ethics here, but you can't say, oh, they're breaking the law because we clearly see that the idea of breaking the law, I'm not saying we should take this cavalierly at all, right? And Martin Luther King also, he said, you gotta be very careful with this principle and how it's done, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is the, the very concept of civil disobedience goes back to the Torah. And I think everybody agrees with it. It's just a question of, what is a law which is worthy of us violating? That's the question. All right, so now let's go on. I wanna to turn to the question, and this is actually a very interesting little piece here. Again, I'll, as I've been saying all along, I am not coming down at any of these questions. All I'm doing is bringing Torah sources that can help us think through some of these questions. So I think that the next story is very interesting. What happens? About a chapter later, Moshe grows up, right? Remember, where was Moshe growing up? Moshe grew up in the, cal in the palace of Pharaoh. It wasn't those days. Moshe grows up. He goes out and he sees his brothers. He sees the other Jews. And he sees an Ishmitri, an Egyptian, beating a Hebrew, beating a Jew. What does Moshe do? He turns to the right. He turns to the left. He doesn't see anybody there. What does he do? Vayach et ha He strikes down the Egyptian. Vayit And he hid him in the sand. He, hid, he hides the body. Then the next day, some Jews are also fighting. And Moshe says, Rasha, Lama, why are you striking your friend? And then the Jew says back to him, Mi somcha ish Who made you in charge of us, big shot? Who are you, Moshe? Are you going to kill us just like you killed the other person? And Moshe got very scared because he realized, oh, it's known that I killed somebody. And it actually says that Paro heard about this and he wanted to kill Moshe. It was a little bit shocking because Moshe grew up in his house. But the fact that Moshe killed an Egyptian and Moshe fled from Paro and he went to Midian and that's when he marries Tipora. But why did Moshe run away from Egypt? Let's remember this. Why did Moshe run away from Egypt? because he killed an Egyptian. The Egyptians were oppressing the Jews. The Jews were oppressed. What did Moshe do? Nonviolent protest or violent protest? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty explicit, right? Now, we can make the argument that this one was so immoral. I mean, you can also, you could make the argument, by the way, that this was direct, um, um, Moshe was directly saving the Jew. Then you could make the argument that this wasn't just a question of an Egyptian who was hitting the Jew and making him, you know, putting him in pain, but that the Jew's life was actually in danger. He was beating him to death, although it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that he was beating him to death. In fact, Rashi goes out of his way to explain what right did Moshe have to kill this person? So Rashi claims 
that this particular Egyptian had raped another Jewish woman, and that is a capital offense, even according to Noahide law. And therefore he was justified because this fellow deserved the death penalty. But no, Rashi does not say that the reason Moshe saved him was because it was Hatzalos Nefashos. The halacha is if someone's killing someone else, a rodef, you can kill him first. And that's never the interpretation that's given for this text, or at least the, from the ones that I've seen. Rather, Moshe felt that the oppression was bad. How was Moshe going to stop it? This was a violent act. There's no question about it. Again, I'm not saying that we should then take this and apply it to our time. I'm saying the idea of just saying that, like, without any nuance, that, vi you know, obviously during the Holocaust, right, Jews engaged in violent, the partisans, they didn't only, and these are our heroes, right? So, again, I'm not saying that, that we should apply that to America in 2020. That's different people's question of how bad is it and what, you know, how should we do it and what strategy and all this. I'm just saying the idea, the notion that we are categorically, categorically against that does not seem to be true. By the way, an interesting thing in this book that I'm reading, I keep quoting things because this is the book that I'm reading right now. Um, there, uh, during the, um, um, there, during the uh, beginning of the, of the, of the Montgomery bus boycott, right after Rosa Parks, which is in, in uh, 1955 or 56, something like that. Um, so uh, there was another pastor in Montgomery, Alabama that Abernathy had become friends with. His name was Vernon Johns. He was an elderly person, very, very passionate. And this was just so interesting. He, he talks about in the book, the first time he heard Vernon John speak, we're gonna have, I have another great story about Vernon John. But I wanna just do this. He says, he, he quoted a text from Genesis. I think this is a mistake. It should probably say Exodus. The story of how Moshe was first chosen to lead his people. And he quotes the text that I just quoted. And Vernon began by summarizing his follows. This is a, a, one of his sermons. He says, God saw Moshe when he slew the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. That was the text that we just read. But this is what Vernon said. And he turned to an angel and said, write that man's name down. He <laughs> write down Moshe's name. Later on, I can use him in my program, right? In other words, when God saw Moshe have the courage to actually take matters into his own hand and actually kill this Egyptian oppressor, in Vernon's words, in Vernon John's words, he said, write down that fellow's name. We're gonna use him later on. Then he said to the young men assembled before him, if I were to summarize in a single phrase my remarks to you today, I would title them constructive homicide. Vernon was not a believer in nonviolence as Martin Luther King Jr. and I were at Abernathy speaking. He believed in taking whatever measures were necessary to achieve our God-given or constitutional rights. I'm not condoning this. I'm just saying this isn't that, but isn't so interesting what source did Vernon Johns, who was a very respected preacher in Montgomery, what source did he use to support his belief in actual violent protests when necessary? Moshe. That was his support. I I'm not saying it's a good proof. We could disagree with it all we want, but interesting <laughs> that Vernon Johns in 1955, before the Montgomery bus boycott, who was advocating more of a militant approach, was citing Moshe as his source. Okay. Let's go on. Uh oh, let me just let me just get my chat box stuff. Okay, all right. So let's go on to the next story. This is from Shmosh chapter two. The text says as follows. Okay, I was trying to look. Do the Jewish people ever like gather and protest when they're in when they're in Egypt? So it never says anything explicitly, but I thought this was an interesting text. It was in those days. The king of Egypt had died. There are a few times that the king of Egypt dies and a new pharaoh takes over. I Meaning the pharaoh is obviously not a, not like a personal name, like John or, uh, or, 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 or Michael. It's, uh, it's the name of like the emperor, right? So a new pharaoh comes in. The Jewish people were groaning under the bondage. They cried out. Their cries went out to Hashab from all the work. And God heard their cries and remembered the covenant with Avram. God saw, saw and God took notice. This is the first time, we quote this by the way in the Haggadah of Pesach. This is the first time when they cry, they cry out. 
And I, I thought it was very interesting. I saw a comment here from the Hamik Dover, that's the Nitziv, of the Talit Yehuda Berlin. There's a wonderful commentary on the Torah. He lived in the 19th century in Russia. And he says, Vayizu I'm sorry, it's not translated. They cried out, Nitkabtsu kulam makom echad. What does that mean? They all gathered to one place, meaning all the Jews are individuals. They're all in their work. And all of a sudden there was a rally. They all gathered together. They gather together in prayer and crying out and screaming out. I mean, isn't this the definition of a, of a protest? Now, what's interesting is that built into their protest was God. I mean, I think that's one of the interesting differences. It, it actually was not so different from the protest movement in the 60s, which was very Christian based. Um, you know, in fact, it's, it's fascinating when, when I'm reading this book, right? Whenever they want to, whenever they want to reach out and develop more more leaders of the civil rights movement in any city, what, where's the first place they turn? The pastors, the reverends, and their churches. You know, that's that's what that's what that was the heart of the movement, right? So, but here in the Torah, right, the big factor that doesn't appear as explicitly in other protest movements is the role of God. And that's kind of an interesting thing. Obviously, Martin Luther King was influenced by God and, and inspired by God and believed that he was almost like a prophet speaking God's truth and God's justice. And justice will roll down like the mountain and the river. You know, he quoted Isaiah and all the different texts. But you don't see, like, you don't read, you're not reading, you know, 1965 and like, okay, Bull Connor is, sends the dogs after the people and all of a sudden God intervenes and stops the dogs. You know, we don't have that. That's not what's happening. And God comes and tells the Supreme Court they better strike down segregation. It doesn't happen. It's, it's all happening by people, by human actors. Of course, that's the big difference with the story in Shemos and Exodus, because what happens? The Egyptians oppress us. The people go and protest. And what's the result of the protest? God listens to the prayer, and God brings 10 plagues, basically, right? So it's a very different story in that regard, because you, of course, have the God factor. And that's extremely important. Now, again, I said, I'm just reading through the text, trying to figure out. In the beginning of Parshas Va'era, this is really, really interesting. After the burning bush, Hashem told Moshe, go to Pharaoh. Moshe goes to Pharaoh. He says, God wants you to let them go. What happens after Moshe goes to Pharaoh the first time? The people, says Pharaoh, must be lazy. Nirpimheim, they're lazy. If they're all busy, worried about freedom, they must not be working hard enough. And what is the result of Moshe's first protest? The initial protest movement, what did it do? It actually made it worse for the Jews. And that, of course, happens sometimes with protest movements. It made it worse for the Jews. And Pharaoh actually doubled the work. He made the work harder. The oppression became more severe. And Moshe was very discouraged. Moshe goes back to God and says, God, what do you have me do? This is the end of Parshish Shemos. From the time that I went to Pharaoh, it got worse for the Jews. The, the people think I'm, a, I'm bad because I'm making it harder for them. They want me to just shut up. So what does God say? This is in the beginning of Parshish Ve'era. L'chein emor l'vnei Yisrael. Go tell the Jewish people, I am Hashem. Now these are very famous words. They are the basis of the Seder, the, of the four cups of wine. The whole Seder is structured around the, these few psukim. I will take you out. You know, the Dal of the Shonot Shagula, the four languages of redemption. I'm going to take you out from the bondage of Egypt. I'll save you from the work. I'll redeem you. And and I'll take you to me as a people. These are the four languages of redemption. You know, here we go. I'll, I'll uh, bold them. And I'll redeem you. Villa Kahti, and I'll take you. And then we have the fifth language, which we say is the fifth cup, or maybe the uh, cup of Elijah is the Hevetti, right there, right? And I'll bring you to the land. This is like the most important speech. So I always wonder, what was the reception of the most important speech upon which the whole Pesach Seder is based on? How did the Jewish people receive it when Moshe said, Stop worrying, God's going to take you out, it's going to be great? What happened? By Dabra Moshe, Cain Al Bene Israel, Moshe gave this fancy speech. The low Shamu al Moshe, they couldn't hear Mikotza Ruach Umeavoda Kasha because of their shortness of breath and because of the hard work or their crushed spirit. They, they, they couldn't even hear the speech. They couldn't even think about freedom. And this is actually a very interesting point 
uh, and movements towards freedom when the people who you're trying to free, they don't sometimes want it. Why? Because maybe they're so oppressed and they just want to be able to breathe that this whole idea is actually scary. And I read that text and I was thinking about this text as I'm reading this book. And there was a fascinating passage. I thought this was so, and I want to share it with you guys. This is another story about that same Reverend Ver, Vernon Johns, uh, who we encountered before. And the point of this story was, this was about five years before 1950, about 1950, before the Rosa Parks incident that led to the Montgomery bus boycott, which led to the integration of buses in, in Montgomery and then other cities in Alabama and across the South followed suit. But about five years before that, it almost happened, but it didn't happen. Listen to this story. This is about Vernon Johns. He was not afraid of the white establishment and was always ready to challenge the authority of those whites who enforced Jim Crow laws. Five years before Rosa Parks case, he had attempted to organize a bus boycott, but the time was not right. He had gone on a bus in Montgomery and because he was an old man and his hands were trembling, he dropped his dime as he was trying to put it in the fare box. The coin rolled over by the driver's foot where Vernon could not reach it without getting down on his hands and knees. Whereas the driver could have reached down and picked it up with no difficulty. It was right next to him, right? Instead, the driver snarled, uncle, get down and pick up that dime and put it in the box. Obviously a derogatory way of speaking to an elderly African-American gentleman. His tone was clearly threatening and Vernon responded with defiance rather than fear. I've surrendered the dime. If you want it, all you have to do is bend down and pick it up. The driver was furious. Get down and pick it up right now or I'll put you off this bus. Johns turned to the passengers on the bus, all of whom were black. I prefer to get off the bus rather than to remain where I'm not wanted. Obviously this driver doesn't want us on the bus. And so let's all get off. Basically he tried to start the boycott right there. Let's all get off. If I get off, it's not gonna mean anything, right? I'm just one guy. But if all of us get off and then tomorrow we don't come back, then they're gonna feel it. He tried to start it five years earlier. What happened? They stared at him, meaning the other black passengers on the bus, they stared at him blankly, frozen in their seats, terrified at the idea of defying the bus driver. Come on, Vernon told them, stand up, get off. But he was the only one who had the courage to leave. And later when he told me about it, he shook his head more in sorrow than in anger. Even God, he said, can't free people who behave like that. I read that story, I, I almost started crying. I mean, it was such a poignant, powerful story. But what is this? When they, this word sentence, frozen in their seats, terrified of the idea. What is that? That's Kotzer Ruach and Avodah Kasha, right? That's just like the Jewish people. When Moshe was trying to get them out, what were they saying? Moshe, stop. Don't anger Pharaoh. You're making him more angry. Don't do that, right? It's so powerful how you see this. I mean, to me, that story with Vernon Johns and the rest of that bus is exactly an illustration of Kotzer Ruach of Odokasho when the Jewish people tell Moshe, Moshe, stop. Don't do it anymore. Uh, that's institutional, institutional, institutional. What do, you, what do you mean exactly, James, when you're saying that? You want to un unmute yourself? I can't hear you. I don't know yeah, if it, Yeah, sorry, I couldn't find the mute. Um, yeah, just the, that the institution of the race, the, of the ingrained racism was so deep that it was completely ingrained, just completely ingrained in them. Like yeah. in totally institution, into the institutionalization of race, ra in, in, institution of racism, just like right. so beat down by it. Exactly, and, and, and we see this, the Jewish people in, in, in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, were so, that's what happened to them, you know? And they, they couldn't even see Moshe as someone who'd come to help them at that point. It was a very, very powerful story. Obviously, five years later, they were ready. They were more ready, and they were able to do it. But it's very, very possible. Okay, now here's going to be the most controversial thing that I'm going to say all night. So, like I said, so up until now, what do we have? Up until we now, we have the right, perhaps the obligation to protest. When it comes to laws, we see from, um, again, even Martin Luther King will tell you, you don't just take it lightly that you could just break any law, but when there is a law that's unjust, you are supposed to break it, okay? So the idea of breaking law 
is not necessarily against any ethical code. I think everybody agrees with that. To, for Jews to break Nazi the Nuremberg laws would be ethical, right? It's just the question of what's ethical and not. So I think that's a, help, a helpful thing because it means that when we're disagreeing about it, everybody, I hope, fundamentally agrees that if there's a law that's actually immoral and not just, that we're supposed to break it. It's no law, you know, that's not considered a law. And then the question is, so obviously civil disobedience under certain circumstances, you can't say that it's not, it's not mandated in certain situations. Okay, what about violence? Is violence ever justified? So we saw the story with Moshe. But here I wanna make a bigger argument. Let me ask you the question this way. Did the Jewish people end their slavery in Egypt without violence? Now they themselves were not violent. I mean, they were oppressed, they were slaves. Maybe there was a little bit of violence. But maybe the Jewish people did not commit violence. But was there violence? Was violence necessary in order to end the slavery? And the answer is absolutely. It never would have happened without violence. But who committed the violence? Not the people, but God. Or Moshe, right? What are they called? The 10 plagues, right? Are you going to tell me that there was no violence in Egypt in order to get the Jewish people out? We had blood, okay? What was blood essentially? It was poisoning the national water system of the, of the Egyptians, right? Now again, the Jewish people didn't do it, but Moshe did it, right? Now Moshe did it with his very special power with God, right? Could you imagine if Martin Luther King would have said that if you don't end segregation, I'm gonna poison all of the water systems in, in Alabama? They would have said, what an extremist. That, I'm not saying he should have done it. But isn't that what Moshe did when Moshe took the staff and put it on the water? Again, I am not saying, I'm just saying like, now the difference of course is, yeah, but Martin Luther King would have had to put some poison or something to mess up the water system himself, whereas Moshe just put the staff and then it happened, you know? But essentially that's what happened. Frogs, they wreaked havoc on the population. Afterwards, the text says there are piles of trash of these frogs all over. And they, it said that they, by Yivash, they stunk. They were a terrible smell they left behind. Lice, swarms of animals, livestock, you know, uh, the, the plague of Dever, destruction against personal property, against animals, right? Boils, this was violence. Hail was destruction of property. And also Moshe said to Pharaoh, the people who stay outside, they're gonna die. They're gonna die, this threat of violence, right? Darkness, the death of the firstborn. There was not one home that there wasn't a death. I'm not saying, and again, everything is relative, right? The, 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 um, violence or nonviolence, it has to be relative to the form of the oppression. And that's the problem. Everyone disagrees about what depression is. But the idea of, again, I am not at all condoning this. And I think that absolutely in today's day and age, I, I, my personal opinion is that violence is completely wrong. That's my personal opinion. That's my personal opinion about the situation. All I'm trying to push back against, against is the idea that violence per se is automatically immoral. It's not true because of this text. Now, of course, the big counter argument to what I'm saying is that God was involved in this violence, right? But there is no way in the world that it would have happened without, without violence. The, the abolition of a slave would not have happened without the Civil War, obviously. There was a lot of violence, right? It doesn't mean that it's justified in other contexts. And Martin Luther King was very strong about, about this. Um, but, you know, when you, you can't, how can you think about the exodus from Egypt with the 10 plagues and not think about violence? There's a lot of violence there, a lot of violence. Okay, now what might have been the function of all of this violence, if you will? It's very interesting. If you look, for instance, in the, par, in the plague of locusts, the text says, look, Hashem, you know, Pharaoh kept hardening his heart. And, and Moshe said, if you don't let them out, tomorrow I'm going to bring locusts. And the locusts will come and they're going to eat everything. And what happens? Pharaoh's servants or, or his courtier, the people around, they start hearing this. And they're like, Pharaoh, it's enough. Let them go. Meaning, what is the function? I'm not condoning it, but what's the function of violence, the conduction, or certainly destruction of property, if people feel it hard enough, you know, like this was the, they wanted to boycott in the 60s, they boycotted all the white owned businesses in, in, in different cities. 
that were that were going along with segregation. Those people were they didn't do anything wrong. They they didn't make those laws. They were just going along with them. But they figured that if they could boycott the white owned businesses and the white owned business owners felt it, then they would go ahead and push back against segregation. That was what they were trying to do. So here, what happens is when the Egyptians find out that the locusts are going to come and eat all their food if they don't let the, the Jewish people go, the Egyptians start going to Pharaoh and saying, let the people go. We don't want them here anymore. We have to stop this. Again, you can say is that slavery is not the same thing that happened in the 1960s and what happened in now is not the same thing that happened in the 1960s. You have to judge it. But the idea of not of, of, of saying that all these things are automatically off, off it, it, we have to have a little bit more of a nu more nuanced conversation. I, anyways, so that happens. It also happens with the plague of the, of the firstborn. So uh, I'm going to just stop my screen here because we're going to basically end, end really soon now. But basically, what we just did was we kind of took a tour through the Torah. I have a bunch, many more sources, but there's not enough time. Maybe I'll do them up for the next class on rabbinic and halachic texts on the question of, of protest and nonviolence and civil disobedience. But I, I took those three questions, the question of the right or the requirement to protest against injustice. I took the question of when and in any situation is it okay to have civil disobedience to break laws if you consider them to be unjust? And even the question of property destruction and violence and we went through the Exodus story and we saw them gather and we saw a certain sense of a protest movement. We saw people violating laws that were clearly unjust like the midwives. We maybe even saw violence from Moshe when Moshe killed the uh, Egyptian taskmaster. Um, and then we saw that actually the role of violence played a huge role in the Exodus through the 10 plague. There weren't just like peaceful protests and then Pharaoh said, okay, fine, you can go. That never happened. That did not happen. So the question is obviously very, very complicated, not easy, lots of things. From my perspective, the real big debates are how unjust is what's going on? That's really the question. And does it warrant it? But the concept of saying that violence is never warranted or breaking laws is never warranted, I don't think that we would agree with that. Certainly not as Jews who went through the Holocaust, who have ancestors and relatives who've been through the Holocaust. Because we would never say that Nazi Nuremberg laws are just, and we would say that it would be a mitzvah to violate them and a mitzvah to fight against them. And sometimes we would say that, of course, violence is justified, the partisans, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that doesn't mean that that's a direct application. And that's every time when we're doing the share, I'm just looking at our Jewish sources and texts to try to help us understand some of these questions without making any statements. You could make the argument that, yes, but this is different and this is different, and that's what we all have to do. And that's what, that's what sensitive learning is all about. But the idea is, and the one other thing I would say is that we have to be consistent though, right? If we find ourselves on the left side of these questions and we're like, yes, they should violate the law, they should do this, then we can't turn around when people on the right are doing the same thing and saying that it's inherently immoral because they're breaking law because of this, because of that. We could say that we disagree with their cause, but you can't say, and same thing if you're on the right and you look at the people on the left. And I think that that actually is a richer conversation because it has a certain recognition of certain basic principles that I think in a certain way, ironically, we probably all share. And maybe there are a lot more <laughs> convergence of people on the extreme left and the extreme right around these issues. They just happen to debate when should these principles be applied? But the basic ideas they, about protest and how to do protest, they might actually find that they actually agree a little more on. Anyways, I don't know. I had a great time preparing this year because it was very interesting to look at the same stories from the CS Mitzrayim, the Exodus that we talk about all the time and look at it specifically through this lens. Um, also, this is a great book. I just happened to find it in the Friends of the, Friends of the Library, you know, right next to Mutti's and I've been really enjoying this book. Um, but um, I'm not sure, maybe next class, we'll look at some of the rabbinic texts on this. Um, another que question that I really want to look at very seriously is the issue of slavery itself and the history of slavery within Jewish texts. And it's very, very interesting, very complicated uh, series of sources around, around, around uh, Jew Jewish approaches to actual slavery. Um, and then, and I'm, I'm, this is the one I'm scared of, so I've been pushing it off. I definitely want to look at the question of the role of police and police brutality and when they have justification and when they don't. 
And I want to look at that question too. So that's probably going to be the most controversial one. And I've been kind of pushing it off, but I'm trying to learn a little bit more. So I'm sorry for not knowing exactly what our next class will be on, but we will be meeting um, uh, next Tuesday night. Okay. Have a uh, wonderful night, everyone. Thank you for joining me. If you have any questions or any ideas about the class, and I know many of you have been sending me uh, thoughts and suggestions, please, uh, please send them to me. Um, be more than happy to incorporate them in future classes. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.